Hi, welcome to another edition of Northwest Outdoors. On this show, we cover activities all over the Pacific Northwest. But on this episode, we head north to Alaska. There, we go fishing for salmon on the Nushagak River with Dan's Specialty Guide season. Service. After that, we head to Brooks Camp to watch the brown bears feeding on salmon. So stay tuned for your Northwest Outdoors. Funding of Northwest Outdoors is made possible in part by O'Loughlin Trade Shows. Puyallup, Portland, and the Denver Trade Shows are proud supporters of public television throughout the Northwest, placing an emphasis on education for the great outdoors. By Kershaw Knives of Portland, Oregon. Makers of precision tools and cutlery, Kershaw Knives continues to support outdoor programming and outdoor activities throughout the Pacific Northwest and by Northwest Dock Systems of Eatonville, Washington. Manufacturers of Herb's pontoon boats, Northwest Dock Systems supports safe and environmentally responsible enjoyment of the outdoors. We begin this show in the air above the small southwestern Alaskan town of Dillingham. From here, fishing host Hobart Manns and the Northwest Outdoors camera are headed for some of the richest fishing waters in the 49th state. Our destination is the Nushagak River and the fishing camp of Dan Ross. Ross's camp is one of a few temporary staging areas to fish during the magnificent runs of king and coho salmon that make their way here each year. The Nushagak River feeds into Bristol Bay and is home to millions of spawning salmon making this area rich in sport and commercial fishing. We spent a couple of days here as guests of Dan and wife Susie to experience firsthand a true Alaskan fishing vacation. This is the end of the fall Chinook season when only a few customers are here finishing out the year fishing for big kings. On board with Hobart are three of the camp's fishing guides, out for a day of fun and fishing. We're going to be turning the boat sideways at the top part of the hull, float down over the hull, cast out behind the boat and just drag our bait right behind the boat and these fish. Kind of a steelhead uh, drift with the uh, boat moving instead of the... Uh, okay. uh, we call this boondogging or, or bait dragging. There it's up. Uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, yes. This is what we're looking for. We got two on. There's another one out there. There's got three on. Let's hope you got a big one here. We got what, Let's try three for a quad. Three porkers at one time. What size fish are we going to see in here? Uh, these fish are range anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds is your most common size range. <laughs> I don't know what size this is, but it would be nicer if we could see him. Four. Quad. quad. We got a quad. Four. Four <laughs> Count them. One, two, three, four. Now this is, no wonder you sent me out here with three guides, right? <laughs> one of those fish well, is fairly big. Just took us a while to find them, but I think we found them. Some of them are quick, some of them are fast. He's got a big one over here. We got guys running all over the boat. Big fish, little fish. That fish back there at the back end of the boat's a big one. I got a little one. He's a dink. Little Jack. Little, little Jack, yeah. He's got, he got, oh, that one's nasty. Get rid of him. Thirty plus. Wow, oh, yeah, it fits right, right in that ballpark there. I'd say about 28, 30. We'll do a nice hook release here. Lee, would you explain to me why we've rigged this this way? Well, we got right here is a six-odd hook with a cluster of eggs on it and a little corking, a bead. 
And right up here we got a cheater. This cheater gives it some buoyancy. So when a, the lead's dragging on the bottom, this cheater whoops, will enable that bait to right up off the bottom a little bit, right about where their eye level is so they can see it. So we've got a, a drift sinker set up. Right. We've got a, a floating bobber and bait. So we've got color, attractant, and scent all in one all situation. In one. And you're using 50 pound leader, which is something that you mentioned earlier, but uh, I'm sure there's a need for it because we're dealing with occasional fish that could run into that category. Yes, exactly. And secondly, if you're dealing with a lot of 25s that want to scratch that leader, at least you don't have to change it every other fish. Exactly. I know that we've chosen this water off of the mouth of this river here, the secondary little feeder stream because there's fish tagged up on it. But how deep is the water we're fishing? Right here, um, we're coming off of about 15 feet of water right here, and it's, it's going to run about 15, 16 feet down along this turn right here. And um, these fish are just in this, this groove. Over here on the other side, you have about six, seven feet. So these fish are in this, what we call a groove or a channel of the river, right off this river mouth. And they've been kegged in here for a couple days. Now this water's got good color by my standards. Uh, I rather expected coming this far north that we'd see glacial silt or coloration and uh, it's really quite clear. Is there any well, reason for that? Well, as the summer's gone on, we've had a pretty dry summer up here so far. And um, first part of the season, we had really high water and deep, deep green water and um, even though it's dropped quite a bit it's still still got a good green tint to it. One other thing that's interesting is it's got a nice snag free bottom. Is there... It's beautiful isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Hardly, like... any, hardly any logs, no big boulders, all just real nice fine rounded pea gravel. What are you doing there, Marty? You've got a, a, a bobber on? Yeah. Well, this is a little Oregon technique I'm going to try here in Alaska. I experimented with it some yesterday and it was highly effective. What we can do with this, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I've got this little got a stop piece of line up there and you can slide that up and down your line to adjust just how deep you want that bait to be running. That bobber will slide all the way up there until it hits that stop. Yep and then that's how deep you're running. And on the screen back here, we were marking fish in the six to 10 feet range, and you're gonna drop it down in that six to 10 feet that's range. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm watching that finder, seeing where those fish are running, and trying to put it right in their zone. And you're gonna maintain it a lot better than we will bouncing along the bottom, right, because you guys, you're gonna be right in their face the entire drift. Right. And that's what I'm trying to do. You Keep it right. You devil, you. <laughs> right in their nose. You, and of course, you got the only bobber in, in, the, uh, in all of western Alaska, I'm <laughs> sure. Works very, very good at home, and so far it's proven pretty effective up here. Let's see if you catch a fish on it, well, huh? I think I can. I'm going to set it for about, that's about six feet right there. I'm going to go for a couple more. About How many fish a year actually enter this stream as far as Chinook are concerned, or well, what's, their, what's their suggested numbers that they think may be here? Their prediction for this year was 214, 214,000. 214,000. 214,000. And of that amount, uh, the sport fishery are supposed to take what, six or 8,000 maybe? Well, they, they'd like to keep it about 5,000. You got a, do you? You got a lunch fish, and he he says he's got a torpedo fish back here. I mean, killer King Kong. Okay, that's what we want. Let's get the net there, Russ. That's what we're looking for. It'd be a good thing to uh, bring those two up. You hear the term Cromerly, and you and then there are these fish that have changed colors somewhat. Yeah, we'll just put them side by side, and and people can actually see. Why the we, difference? Why we look at one and say it's a, a fish with some color. We might even be able to lay them side by side right up here on the water here. Get a good a good look at the two different fish. 
This red one that we have right here is a uh, male, and they'll, yeah, they he's... tend to color up a little little quicker than the um, females. Oh my, yes. Okay, we'll go them, ahead and get that one in, Marty. and Put them both in the bag, get the one for lunch. and We'll get that one taken care of. And I can do a quick hook release on this one right here if I... Yeah. Go. Get this fish up here and lay down. Nushagak beauty. Nice female fish, about 25 pounds. Fresh in from the salt. Yeah. A couple days, two, three days. Cut it back up. Yeah. Ooh, classic hit. Oh, a derby fish. Your bobber's gone too. Yeah, I missed him. And I missed mine. I gotta wait for the crap. Ready for him? Nice little girl. Hey, in the basket. All these fish have a lot of color, Lee. Is that, and yet they're not in, in from the ocean very long? Well, these fish have been in for about a week, a little bit more than a week. These are the fish from our, our last big shot that we, we got about a week ago. It's kind of kind of neat. Um, oh, about half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, we decided that we would change from the original set, setup that we started the day with. And um, you put on spinning gloves, and they're rigged a little different than the, than the others. Well, yeah, these spinning gloves um, are a little bit bigger than the original setup that we had, so I like to put a few beads up above the hook so when the fish comes and bites it, he's not getting nothing but the spinning glow. That way it gives him a little little room to get that hook. And there's more activity on the lure, too. The, right. the wings are going to keep it uh, uh, moving with a, a spinner effect rather than right. having just the uh, the drift bobber that we had on the earlier right. presentation. Right, it'll spin and throw off a vibration and give it a little something extra. When fishing the Nushagak, guests have three choices for lunch. One, of course, is brown bagging it. Another is going back to camp. Or the most popular is barbecuing a fresh salmon right on shore. Mm -mm -mm. Dan's got a barbecued salmon here. It looks like he's got homemade spices, salt, pepper, and he's got the skin on on that barbecue. And it's a propane barbecue as opposed to briquettes. That way he can turn them on and off and we don't have any fire problems out here in the wilderness. Great lunch, Dan, just the way things should be. Here's one for somebody. Got him. Picked it up, good. Nice little run. I don't know if it's as heavy a fish as the ones we got earlier in the day, Lee, but it's uh, definitely uh, there. And we'll take a look. What'd you do, just get a bite? No. No? No, I haven't even found bottom yet. Now it's, now it's decided to get serious, coming around underneath okay, you. Okay, you need to come around the horn? Yeah. Well, let them sulk. I know how to get out of those guys' way. They ain't gonna like me anyway. Oh, he wanted to get back where we could see it. It is uh, definitely not liking us. And it is taking line. And I've got it snubbed down pretty good and it's still running hard. Just bammed it. Look at that, he's still out there making Hot runs. Uh, right. He may not be bright, but he is big. Did you see that tail? Yes. 
<laughs> oh my. I can put some pressure on him now after that last run, I think. There we go. Okay, Try and keep him just where he's at, soaking here. I can see the uh, bobber he's down there about eight, ten feet. Yeah. Eight or ten feet down. Come on, baby. This is a nice fish. I notice none of you guys are worried about this fish at all. There's nobody here with a net. There's a. <laughs> they they've seen this stuff this before. I'm sure they're not even close to concern because that fish isn't ready yet. He's ready. I lied. Oh, did I lie? Come on, this is probably my biggest Chinook of the day so far. I'm gonna make one more pass and bring him up. My very best one of the day. What? Oh, ho, ho, ho. yes. Yeah, a little one. Itty bitty. Lee, what do you think that fish is going to weigh for us? That looks like it's at least 25. 25. 25. <laughs> maybe 30. Chrome right. bright, look at that. It's bigger than any Willamette 25. I'd say 30 pounds. Yeah. Might bring him up. Yep. Let's put him in here, Lee. Okay. Looks like a good fish. We'll take Sounds a good, good look at him. Oh, it's a beaut. Look at that. Got that spin glow right in his mouth. That's about as big a smile as I'm going to have for a fish this season. Picture doesn't get any better than that, does it? Sure doesn't. Lee, the, this stream really doesn't compare to anything that we've got down in the in south america as they say up here but uh in oregon and washington i don't really know of any stream that would be quite comparable on some respects the size and the dynamics of the stream maybe the lower willamette but uh, where would you compare it with uh, upper willamette up yep. above oregon city up around um, st paul salem area okay you have the uh, rivers you know shallow a lot of gravel bars a lot of um deciduous yeah. growth like what you see here and a lot of grassy areas, high banks. On the, under that assumption that the run in the Willamette or some of the other Oregon and Washington coastal streams more or less trickles through. It doesn't just uh, come through in a, in a big shot. Here the fish come through in, in swells or in waves more than, than a constant. Every tide brings you a few fish on, like on the coast stream. Right. Right, um, before the, sea, the fish really got going here this year, um, it was just almost nothing. And then all of a sudden, boom, I mean, we had several thousand fish move by in one day, whereas the day before, maybe a couple hundred. Huh. And for a river of this size, a couple hundred fish is yeah, you wouldn't even pretty, see. pretty tough to find. You wouldn't even see them in there. Ah, oh, those spinning gloves, those things work awesome. See? <laughs> the big wing bug did work, huh? It did. I had a pickup and you picked up the fish. I don't see a hill for a kajillion miles. Big old delta here. A big delta, huh? Wow, look at that. Look at that fish go. One of the other things that is, is interesting is that if this is a classic example of how to read a river. Here's a flat body of river, and if you were on it for the first time, where should you be? Well, what you want to look for, um, Chinook fishing um, or king fishing up here, as we call them in Alaska, you always want to look, they're always going to be running pretty much in the, in the deeper part of the river. And the deeper part of the yeah, river? So usually on the, on the high, high bank. High bank on is going to be bank. deep bank. Now you will find these kings running in shallow water when the water is on the higher side. Um, early, in the, early in the season we had them running in shallow water, but as the water's dropped through the season, they've moved back they've moved out into the um, channel and into the deeper part of the holes you know it'd, like it'd, we're fishing right here today it'd be the polite thing for this fish to uh, tell you to uh, stand still in one place so you could work on it no 
Oh yeah, there we go. Beauty. She sure is. Nice drag on that reel too. That yeah, that they really are. Bantam is. They really are smooth. You can hear it humming right there. Is the taking everything that that fish wants to throw at it and not going gunny sack on us at all. And those reels have caught several hundred fish per reel oh, already. That fish thought he was going to come in here, and then he got a look at. Was it you or me that he didn't like? Must it's have been you. Probably me. Because I shaved this morning. <laughs> Yep, she's been been up in a sock eye, yeah, definitely. Okay, I'll try to give her the old turn around. No, I didn't. Whew! Well, let's go ahead and we'll open her up here and see where that hook's positioned at. Boy, he's a big one. In there doing the old croaker routine too. Yeah, something has gotten that fish before because look at the uh, look at the uh, the net marks on the head of that fish. Right. Yeah, she's she's kind of marked up. He really has had to fight through a a bad situation. A lot of adversity. Pardon? She's gone through a lot of adversity to get here. Okay, and there she goes. After a day of fishing the Nushagak and pulling in hundreds of pounds of salmon, it was time to return to camp for dinner. Back at camp are cooks Susie and Christy, preparing a full course meal in the camp's completely outfitted kitchen. No detail is spared for dinner, down to the homemade blueberry pie. This camp is only erected for a couple of months during the prime time of fishing season. Besides the kitchen, it also has showers and a walk-in freezer to process fish. Owner Dan Ross shipped it all up from Oregon to offer visitors the comforts of home while fishing the waters of the Nushagak River. How many species of fish would we expect to see in the river out here? Well, like we're saying in, in uh, June and July here on the Nushagak, you've got your chum salmon, your sockeye salmon, and of course the famous Nushagak king salmon. Then on top of those three species of salmon, we're catching grayling trout here. Uh, we've got some rainbow fishing up a little further in the river. Pike, numerous pike. Oh, it's amazing how many fish are here. You, right down on our beach there on the tents, um, we got a pole holder, two pole holders on the front of each tent so the customers can sit there in the evening and relax and, and catch fish right off their deck. We had guys catch 10 to 20 kings after fishing all day, come in in the evening, sit and relax on their deck, and catch another 10 nice big 30 pound kings. It's, it's bizarre. The next day's adventure starts with an amphibious plane ride to the Katmai National Park and Reserve to see the brown bears feeding at the famous Brooks Camp. Our pilot is Will Johnson. But, um, typically in the summer we'll fly uh, 100 hours or so a month, um, sometimes more. Usually our line pilots fly more than that. Uh, but if I, get... I think the big problem uh, with being a bush pilot in Alaska is uh, the weather. And, and not so much that we have a corner on bad weather because there's a lot of places have bad weather but we don't have a lot of weather information and we don't have a lot of uh, instrument facilities and navigational aids to deal with the weather. So a lot of times when we take off, we don't know what the weather is we're going to encounter and we're having to uh, basically look out the window and make uh, decisions as we go as to whether or not we'll continue the trip or have to turn around. I believe one of the best ways to view Alaska is from the seat of a small airplane and uh, flying above the country and then landing and getting out and actually seeing it uh, on foot up close. Brooks Camp has a visitor center, lodge, cabins, campgrounds, and the famous Brooks Falls. You're at the Brooks River, or a place called Brooks Camp, and this is one of the world's greatest bear viewing areas. One of the things we want to be sure that people and bears behave correctly around each other, so when you arrive at Brooks Camp, you're required to go through an orientation. 
with a ranger, we show you a video about how bears behave and how people should behave. And that has worked very well in keeping things safe here for people. With no fee to view the bears, up to 16,000 visitors a year visits Brooks Lodge, with overnight camping available right in the middle of bear country. From the main lodge, Brooks Falls is only a mile and a half walk, down a path to the falls viewing platform. Some really simple things are, one is you need to always be on the lookout for bears, because they can be anywhere. Uh, you want to make noise, clapping your hands, whistling, singing. A lot of people just say, hey bear, hey bear. You want the bears to know you're coming. You don't want to surprise bears, especially sows with cubs, which we have several of around. Um, food is the really important thing here, though. We do not want bears to learn to take, get food from people or that people are associated with food. So we, we want you to eat only in a picnic area or at the lodge. No taking food along the river. Um, and then the other one is, if you see a bear, you need to give it the right of way. You need to get out of the way, move off the trail, let the bear go where it wants to go. Don't try to change its behavior. The bears are very close to the viewing platform, which holds up to 40 people at a time, allowing great opportunities to photograph and view one of nature's truly spectacular scenes. Well, we actually have one species here. Those are brown bears, and which you might call grizzlies if you were away from the coast. But as you get near the coast, uh, we call the same species brown bears. Well, this is a really special place because the salmon come in from the ocean. They come up the Naknek River into Naknek Lake that Brooks Camp sits on, and then they move up through the Brooks River, and they get stuck at Brooks Falls. And that's why it's such a good place for bears. The salmon have to stop. They pull up. It's an effort to get over the falls, and while the salmon are trying to get through, the bears take advantage of it and grab them. Oh, got it. Oh. I think I got them. I think I got them in. These brown bears weigh in between 400 and 1,000 pounds, and many sport battle scars from confrontations over fishing spots. They do give each other space, avoiding eye contact while holding themselves in non-aggressive postures. Once in a while, though, there is a flare-up. Brooks Camp is kind of a special place. We allow a lot of people to come in here but we do help them understand how to behave, and we provide safe viewing facilities like bear viewing platforms. We have two of those. We're adding two more next summer so that you'll, you'll be able to get up off the ground even, you know, to view bears where they're concentrated. On the other hand, you get to walk among the bears here, which, you know, is really exciting to most people. They like to think that they're gonna come around the corner and see a bear, as long as they're behaving correctly. But, but one of the things that happens here is even though these bears are wild, they are habituated to people somewhat. So, there's a fine line that we want to maintain where bears are wary enough but comfortable enough. And that's what we use all of our rules and things to manage for. That's why this works so well. Um, if, if they were totally wild, it might be a problem. And if they were totally habituated, they might come up to you and try to take food from you. So we, we try to keep that balance right, right where it needs to be. On the next Northwest Outdoors, continue the adventure in Alaska. Go after vicious northern pike. Fish for more kings on the Nushagak. Plus, visit the Peter Pan Cannery in Dillingham. Check out Northwest Outdoors online to learn more about this episode, show 1308. Funding of Northwest Outdoors is made possible in part by O'Loughlin Trade Shows. Puyallup, Portland, and the Denver Trade Shows are proud supporters of public television throughout the Northwest, placing an emphasis on education for the great outdoors. By Kershaw Knives of Portland, Oregon. Makers of precision tools and cutlery, Kershaw Knives continues to support outdoor programming and outdoor activities throughout the Pacific Northwest and by Northwest Dock Systems of Eatonville, Washington. Manufacturers of Herb's pontoon boats, Northwest Dock Systems supports safe and environmentally responsible enjoyment of the outdoors.